Hello and welcome to The View from Mayor Brown podcast. This is a fortnightly podcast series for employment lawyers and HR practitioners which highlights developments in case law and legislative changes of importance to UK employers. It is presented by Nicholas Robertson, the head of Mayor Brown's London employment team. The time spent listening to these podcasts can count towards your CPD requirements and at the end of the podcast we will explain how to get in touch if you wish to claim CPD points or if you have any comments or questions. Hello and welcome to the Mayor Brown Employment Podcast uh, which is available on iTunes via the Mayor Brown website and on YouTube these days uh, with links to the podcast and the cases mentioned uh, also available via Twitter. First of all, uh, my apologies for the short break in the podcasts. Um, I was off last week um, at Harvard uh, on the Mayor Brown Management for Partners programme, which is absolutely fascinating. I've been head of the London Employment Team for um, five years now, five years going on six years. And it was amazing just how much I learned and how much we all learned uh, from the Mayor Brown Partners on the course. So uh, tip for the top, um, because I firmly believe how you manage uh, in a team makes a difference between success and failure and in these days uh, those margins are getting ever uh, narrower um, if you ever do get a chance to go on such a course jump at it because uh, it's amazing how much you'll learn so to business uh, in this podcast we're going to be looking at three uh, three cases the first case considers whether in the context of an age discrimination case the mental processes of the decision maker alone should be considered in relation to the motivation for the employee's dismissal, or whether the tribunal also needs to take account of the motivation of others who are involved in providing views on the employee to the decision maker. Secondly, we're going to look at a whistleblowing case and whether it was reasonable for an employer to dismiss an employee for contacting the Information Commissioner's Office in breach of an instruction by the employer. Thirdly, um, the, we look at the EAT, which is l considering the common question for employers of whether to place disciplinary proceedings on hold to deal with a grievance from the same employee. So, first case, um, CLFIS, brackets UK Limited, and Reynolds. And this is a Court of Appeal decision. It looks at whether a tribunal, in the context of a discrimination claim, should focus only on the motivation of the person who makes the decision to dismiss, or whether this assessment should be extended to include those whose views impacted the decision. In this case, the dismissal was not in itself a discriminatory act, but was allegedly rendered discriminatory by the alleged motivation of others who were indirectly involved in the employee's dismissal. I, should, I say employee, she was in fact a consultant, but I'll probably refer to her as an employee throughout for just reason of reference. So Dr Reynolds, she'd been um, with the company for many years and had got to stage. she was 73 years old. She was the chief medical officer under consultancy agreement uh, working for Canada Life, the employer. And the agreement, her consultancy agreement was terminated by the general manager following a presentation um, by um, the managing director and another manager that raised various concerns around her performance. The Employment Tribunal dismissed Dr Reynolds' claim for direct age discrimination, concluding that the general manager of Canada Life had genuinely believed that at the time of his decision to dismiss, Dr Reynolds was a poor performer. This decision to terminate her contract was taken solely by the general manager, and although the presentation report did not actually recommend dispensing with Dr Reynolds' services, the tribunal accepted that this was the understanding that the general manager took from the presentation. The tribunal considered that the general manager was dissatisfied with Dr Reynolds' performance and did not believe that she was capable of change. And this was a belief, crucially, which the tribunal decided was itself based on the general manager's knowledge of Dr Reynolds, and this had been the general manager's reasons for dismissal, not the claimant's age. In its decision, the Court of Appeal noted that the tribunal's focus throughout its reasoning was the motivation of the general manager as the responsible decision maker and not on the mental processes of others who had informed the general manager during the process. Dr Reynolds, having lost the employment tribunal case, appealed to the AT on three grounds, and we're just going to look at the first, that the tribunal had misdirected itself in considering only the general manager's mental processes and should not have disregarded the involvement of other individuals in the process leading up to uh, Dr Reynolds' termination. 
The AT had allowed Dr. Reynolds' appeal, concluding that, quote, if a prohibited ground, whether race, sex, age, or another prohibited ground, had a significant influence on the outcome, it may be said that discrimination has been made out, even if the person who makes the actual decision has not acted for that reason, if one examines only the mental processes of that person. Canada Life appealed the decision, pleading four grounds of appeal, but again in this podcast I'm just going to look at the main one, that the tribunal had been right to focus exclusively on the mental processes of the general manager, because he was the sole decision maker, and the EAT had been wrong to reverse this decision. And just pausing there, this is one of those points which, at first sight, the EAT's um, comment, well, if discrimination played any part, then it's discrimination, which seems to make sense until you drill down. And that's what the Court of Appeal did, and I think very cogently. So <clears throat> the Court of Appeal considered that if the decision to terminate Dr. Reynolds' contract had been made jointly by the general manager and others, the tribunal would have had to be concerned with the motivation of all those responsible, since a discriminatory motivation on the part of any of them would be sufficient to taint the decision. However, the Court of Appeal held that the findings in question clearly demonstrated that the general manager was the sole decision taker and that although he reached his decision as a result of information provided and opinions expressed by other individuals, that was not the same as them being parties to the decision. The Court of Appeal highlighted that supplying information or opinions which are used for the purpose of a decision by someone else does not constitute participation in that decision. And although the Court identified that there may be cases where it's difficult to distinguish between the two situations. Here, it considered the tribunal was fully entitled to treat this case as one where the general manager did indeed make the relevant decision on his own. And it's clear from his evidence that, because of Dr Reynolds' eminence and long service, the decision to, take, to terminate her contract was a matter for which he took sole responsibility. So, the Court of Appeal then identified that this is a case concerned with a situation where an act, which is detrimental to a claimant, is done by an individual who is innocent of any discriminatory motivation, but who might have been influenced by information supplied or views expressed by another employee whose motivation is, it is alleged, discriminatory. So the court referred to this case as a case of tainted information, a tainted information case. The court of appeal considered two forms of approach for the legal basis on which a remedy might be available in a tainted information case. And they called one the composite approach and the other the separate acts approach. The composite approach involved bringing together the decision maker's act with the informant's alleged motivation to assess the motivation for dismissal, while the separate acts approach involved treating the informant's alleged um, discriminatory motivation as a discrete discriminatory act for which the employer might be liable. Consequently, under the separate acts approach, Dr Reynolds would be able to recover for the losses caused by her dismissal as a consequence of the informant's act rather than the, because the dismissal in itself was unlawful. In other words, the damages would flow from the wrongful act. The Court of Appeal disagreed with the composite approach, concluding that the individual employee who did the act complained of, here, the gen dismissal by the general manager, must have been motivated by the protected characteristic for the claimant to win. The Court of Appeal held that it would be unfair for the General Manager's Act to be held as discriminatory on the basis of someone else's motivation. Although the Court agreed with the claimant's argument that the separate acts approach was a more complex and slightly over-analytical approach, it concluded it was the correct approach in a tainted information case and that the con conduct of the person supplying the information should be treated as separate from that of the person who acts on it. In theory, the person supplying the tainted information could be sued for that wrongful act, and if it caused the individual to lose their job, then damages for job loss could be awarded against the tainted informant and potentially the employer. Although the court accepted it might be difficult to prove causation on this basis, the court felt that was right and proper. If it was not clear that the individual would have lost their job but for the provision of the tainted information, then in principle the issue of causation was relevant in considering the award of damages. The Court of Appeal therefore upheld the original Employment Tribunal's decision to consider only the general manager's motivation and concluded that the EAT was wrong to allow Dr Reynolds' appeal on that basis. And this is a useful case, given it's a pretty common scenario for employers, and it's surprising it's not really been addressed specifically by the courts before. Had it gone the other way, it would open up the whole field for claimants to extend the parameters of who a tribunal should be um, 
looking at when considering discrimination complaints. And tribunal claims would have become much longer because you would have to have called for scrutiny everyone who might have had some sort of discriminatory motivation on a case. So the decision is likely to be welcomed by tribunals and employers alike. Equally, individual respondents can feel comforted that it's unlikely they'll be held liable for the motivations of informants in the dismissal process. However, this decision does, at least for me, highlight the importance for employers of choosing a decision-maker with caution and looking at their potential motivation carefully. Equally, if you have joint decision-makers, the employer should look at the mental processes of each in turn. It may be that, as a result of this case, claimants now seek to look beyond the dismissal as to the act complained of and extend their claim beyond the ultimate decision of dismissal, pleading tainted information as separate and discrete acts of discrimination. Finally, I do think it's extremely important to be very clear whether you are dealing with a situation where you have a joint decision maker or a single decision maker, but with support from HR, for example. Um, and I think that was a crucial part of this case, that they were able to establish it was a single decision maker. So next case, Barton and Royal Borough of Greenwich. This is an EAT decision which considers whether an employer acted fairly in dismissing an employee. He was dismissed following his failure to comply with an instruction requiring him not to have further contact with the Information Commissioner's Office pending an inquiry into the employee's underlying concerns. And the EAT also considered whether such an instruction from the employer was itself a reasonable one. In this case, Mr Barton, who was employed by Greenwich, was informed by a colleague that his line manager had sent quote, hundreds, unquote, of emails containing confidential or personal data about himself to her personal email. So Mr Barton consulted the ICO website, following which he emailed the ICO relaying this information and requesting advice. He also subsequently informed the head of Greenwich's housing services and told him of his email to the ICO. The head of Greenwich's housing services told Mr Barton that he would investigate the issue fully and instructing to him that, pending the investigation, Mr Barton should not contact the ICO without the prior authorisation of his line manager. Despite this instruction, Mr Barton telephoned the ICO afterwards to seek advice on the validity of this instruction. Following the non-compliance with, with the instruction about contacting the ICO, uh, Mr Barton was dismissed for a separate act of gross misconduct, after which he brought an unfair dismissal claim against Greenwich, based on the alleged protected disclosures that he'd made, which he said were the original email and the subsequent phone call to the ICO. And that's important, as I shall explain. The tribunal rejected Mr Barton's arguments that these two communications with the ICO amounted to protected disclosures and that they should be considered together as a combined single disclosure. The tribunal considered that the email to the ICO was capable of being a protected disclosure. That was the first one, if you remember, about the the uh, personal emails being the emails being sent to the personal email address. But in fact, it turned out that he, although it was capable, it was not in fact a protected disclosure because of additional tests imposed in the statute, where the disclosure of information is to an external regulator rather than internally you know, f to the employer, for example. If the claimant is going to a regulator, it was also necessary for the claimant to reasonably believe that the information disclosed and any allegation contained within it are substantially true. And the tribunal felt Mr Barton had, in their terms, jumped the gun. The second contact with ICO, which was the phone call, was not a disclosure of information because Mr Barton was seeking advice on the legitimacy of the instruction not to contact the ICO. The tribunal accepted that the dismissal was for breach of the instruction, i.e. the second contact. He was not dismissed, they found as a fact, for the original contact with the ICO. The tribunal dismissed his whistleblowing claims, concluding that his dismissal had been on account of his misconduct and within the range of reasonable responses, particularly given that he had also had a final written warning for misconduct of a not entirely different sort. The, the tribunal also decided that those who had uh, determined Mr Barton's appeal were not influenced by his original contact with the ICO, but instead it was to do with his insubordination in failing to follow Greenwich's instruction. Uh, and they felt this was demonstrated <coughs> particularly clearly in his initial email response to the head of Greenwich's housing services, in which, in response to some concerns being expressed about the contact, he'd said, quote, please do not be silly about this, and then gone off and contacted them. So um, they felt that, that was a rather disrespectful and rude response, which perhaps indicated um, how the individual behaved. 
As to whether the instruction was unlawful as opposed to unreasonable, the tribunal concluded that contact in the ICO in breach of Greenwich's instructions was capable as a matter of law of amounting to a fair reason for dismissal. So Mr Barton appealed to the AT, who agreed with the tribunal that each disclosure must be considered separately and that in any event these two communications with the ICO were not protected disclosures. So that was enough to dispose of the claim that the dismissal was for whistleblowing. But that then left a separate question as to whether or not dismissing him for breach of the instruction not to contact the ICO um, meant there was an unfair dismissal. The argument was that the instruction given by the company was unlawful and it therefore followed that dismissing him for breach of an unlawful instruction gave rise to an unfair dismissal. The court's reasoning is slightly less weighty because the primary point relied upon in the court's decision was that this was a new argument which had not been argued in this way before the Employment Tribunal and so it's not permissible to raise it for the first time at the EAT stage. However, the court went on to decide whether the instruction was unlawful in case there should be a successful appeal on the point whether or not the new point should have been capable of being raised for the first time at the EAT. Um, this meant that the um, claimant's Article 10 argument uh, under the European Convention of Human Rights, which, if you remember, is the right to freedom of expression, uh, was not decided. It's a shame because the claimant was arguing that Article 10, um, the right to freedom of expression, meant that his right to freedom could not be curtailed by the employer. Um, it, I think it's fair to say there are probably some challenges with that argument, but that point was not actually decided. But that one point aside, the EAT did go on to say whether it thought the instruction was unlawful generally, um, as I say, in case the case went up to the Court of Appeal. And they said they could see no basis for finding that the public policy uh, of the UK would impose a blanket restriction on any limitation of contact between an employee and the ICO. And the instruction, in any event, Mr Barton would not have prevented him from speaking to the ICO entirely. He was prevented from contacting the ICO. This didn't prevent him responding to questions raised by the ICO with him. Moreover, he disclosed all relevant information to the ICO. He wasn't seeking to apply to supply further information. He was simply asking for advice when he went back. And there were other avenues for him to obtain advice from if that was what he wanted to know, such as external lawyers. So... The other point that they also mentioned was that um, the manager, the, 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 the um, instruction was don't contact them without seeking my consent first. And the EAT said there's no reason to believe the manager would have acted unreasonably in refusing consent. So the case, I think, demonstrates it may be reasonable for an employer to instruct employees about external authorities that they're able to contact. But as the EAT itself recognised each case is going to be considered by reference to its own facts as to whether or not that instruction, that limitation, is reasonable. And this was considered to be a reasonable instruction by the tribunal. Um, and the EAT said it was able to come to that decision. Um, I think it's a helpful case, but I think it's a slightly seductive and dangerous one. If there are reasonable instructions, they are limited, they're specific, and there's a suitable whistleblowing policy, it may be reasonable for employers to restrict employees from contacting third-party regulators. But obviously, employers need to promote internal reporting where possible to avoid this issue from arising. And it's notif noticeable that one of the factors that counted against Mr Barton in the unfair dismissal claim was that he'd failed to follow the company's own procedures, Greenwich's own procedures, which would have given him a, another way of raising his concerns. And the case was really decided on a fairly narrow basis. So it would be very unwise for an employer to set out to preclude an individual from ever contacting a regulatory authority without going through the employer first. I think this case is more an indication that in appropriate circumstances, with a carefully thought through instruction, it may be possible to limit the downside from an unwise employee or an unwary employee going off to the regulator. Third and final case, Jinadu and Docklands Buses. Uh, this is an EAT decision that looks at the common question faced by many employers of whether a disciplinary process should be put on hold to deal with the grievance. Grievance and disciplinaries are difficult and time-consuming issues for employers, and this is accentuated when the two procedures overlap, as, as was the case here. Ms Jinadu was employed as a bus driver by Docklands Buses and was subject to formal disciplinary proceedings due to her alleged poor driving. At the disciplinary, Ms Janadu was asked to attend a driving training centre course, but she refused. During the course of it, during the course of the disciplinary proceedings, I should say, she raised a number of grievances about some of the managers involved in her disciplinary. 
Despite the grievances raised, Dock- Dockland Buses did not put the disciplinary on hold, instead continued with and completed the disciplinary process. This was, resulted in Ms Gennato's dismissal on the same day as the disciplinary hearing for gross misconduct for reasons of her failure to attend the, the um, driving centre. She brought a claim for unfair dismissal against Dockland Buses, and the tribunal dismissed the claim due to her repeated failure to attend the driving training centre and held that Dockland Buses had acted fairly in dismissing her. The tribunal concluded that the penalty of dismissal lay within the band of reasonable responses that a reasonable employer might have adopted. Ms Gennardo appealed the tribunal's finding of fair dismissal, arguing, amongst a lot of other points, that the dismissal was unfair on the ground that Dockland Buses had failed to put the disciplinary proceedings on hold until her grievance had been investigated. The EAT rejected Ms Gennaro's argument on this point, concluding very firmly that Dockland Buses was not obliged to put the disciplinary investigation on hold until it had dealt with her grievances. Although the EAT's comment on this case was very brief on this point, and Ms Gennaro's appeal was upheld and the case remitted to the Employment Tribunal on a, a, a completely different point, the argument that her dismissal had been unfair on the grounds that Dockland Buses had failed to consider her grievance <coughs> in advance of uh, dismissing her for gross mis- misconduct was rejected outright by the AT. There was no need to put the disciplinary process on hold pending an investigation of her grievances. Again, like the last case, I think this is all going to be quite fact-specific, but unlike the last case, there is no doubt this is a very helpful decision from the AT. It supports the view that if an employer chooses to proceed with a disciplinary in a situation where the employee has raised a grievance or raises a grievance by way of counterattack to the disciplinary, there will be no automatic need to postpone the disciplinary proceedings to deal with the grievance allegations. Clearly, if there was an expectation that, by raising a grievance, a disciplinary process could be delayed or derailed, then there will be lots of grievances raised. It just follows as night follows day. However, it's important to recognise that this case does not say that it will never be necessary or appropriate to delay the disciplinary hearing. And here, as far as I can work out, there may not even have been a formal grievance process started by the claimant. Since the situation does arise very frequently for employers, it's probably worth trying to offer some guidance on the fine judgments that may arise. For example, if an employee is facing a performance management disciplinary hearing and is arguing that their manager is a bully and that the performance management is in fact bullying, the performance management concerns and the bullying allegation are two sides of the same coin, to a great extent. As such, it may make sense to say to the employee that the grievance can be put on hold, but that all of the concerns about bullying will be considered fully in the context of the disciplinary hearing. Sometimes there are separate allegations raised against the manager which are not so closely tied into the disciplinary hearing. For example, the disciplinary manager is going to be prejudiced against me because I caught the manager doing something he should not do, which is unrelated to this disciplinary hearing. In those circumstances, again, it's obviously very disruptive if the disciplinary hearing is going to be adjourned until the disciplinary manager is investigated. There, it may make a lot more sense to consider replacing the disciplinary manager with someone who is not covered by the allegation. And sometimes, however, it is necessary to recognise it's just not possible in a small company or where the manager has necessary specialist skills which are just too relevant to forego in the disciplinary hearing. It may simply not be feasible to have the manager replaced. In those circumstances, it may be appropriate to bring in a second manager or a manager from a sister company, for example, if there is one. It may be possible to continue on unchanged with the same manager, especially if the allegations are only raised after the disciplinary hearings are begun. Thirdly, there are circumstances where the disciplinary hearing and the grievance really do not intercept. So an employee facing charges of misconduct has raised unconnected concerns about another manager. In those circumstances, we have often advised the company to continue with the disciplinary hearing if in practice parties focus on the disciplinary hearing and only subsequently turn to the grievance matter. This has, in my experience, been pretty rarely challenged by claimants subsequently. The other tip I'd offer in dealing with these circumstances is that it is always better to explain the company's reasoning up front rather than to allow it to be challenged subsequently because the company has not taken the opportunity to explain. I'm not saying it's never appropriate to delay a disciplinary hearing and go into a grievance hearing, but I do think it's something that should only be conceded in particularly extreme circumstances. The real danger is that once the individual's grievance goes ahead of the employer's misconduct, or under performance process, the individual has every incentive to delay matters for as long as possible. In such circumstances, employers should also be alive to the fact that they may need to adjust who hears the disciplinary. 
The view of the EAT in Ms. Gennadio's case was that, despite Ms. Gennadio's contention that two particular individuals should not have been involved in her disciplinary process, as she had raised disagreements against them, the disciplinary had been conducted by an individual against whom Ms. Gennadio had no extant grievance. Um, so uh, this is a useful, a useful uh, illustration of the benefits of making sure that you can isolate and insulate this um, trap which individuals sometimes deploy of trying to bring grievance processes against the decision makers. So that's the case of Gennadu and Docklands buses. Um, thank you very much for listening to this particular podcast. Uh, next week, podcast 72, um, we're going to do that one a week early so that we get back on track. Um, so that's going to be episode 72 next week. Um, but thank you very much indeed for listening. Look forward to catching up with you again next week. And as always, we're happy to confirm that Jeremy Clarkson was not harmed or mistreated in the making of this podcast in any way. Thanks very much. So that was our latest podcast. We hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or comments or want to know how to claim CPD points, please email nick at nrobertson at mayorbrown.com. Our podcasts are an overview of the cases and how the law applies in any particular case will obviously depend on the individual circumstances. So please take legal advice if any of the matters discussed are relevant to issues you are dealing with. Thanks for listening.